Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here in Whitehead. Lovely to have you all with us again. And uh, we hope and trust that each and every one of you has a wonderful encounter with God, that you meet with, with Him, your Saviour, your Lord, your Redeemer, the King of your lives, the King of this, of this world. For He is our glorious Lord. We're here to worship this morning, and I want to read a few verses from, uh, from Psalm 46. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. But the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. We're going to join our voices together and sing now. We're going to sing, There is a higher throne than all this world has known. Let's worship God together.
Jairus' daughter. So, we'll look at the Bible story, craft, prayers, and then finish with a final thought. So grab your drink, and a biscuit, and let's do this. When you're stuck at home with time to spare, can't go outside, you're not going anywhere. Why don't you pull up a chair or pull up a suit to an intervirtual Sunday school? We're the craft to do and a story or two. Say hello to Nat, she's stuck at home too. Why not tune in to virtual Sunday school? The story of Jairus' daughter can be found in Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 24 and 35 to 43. There's another story sandwiched in the middle of it. It's pretty cool too, so you can have a read of that yourself. But for now, Jairus' daughter. You know what we haven't done for a while? Told a story with toys. We're filming at church these days, so you know what that means? We have loads of toys to choose from. We'll use these little people. No, Rob, not dinosaurs. Why don't you guys get some of your toys to tell the story to? One day, Jesus was out and about when a very important man, an official from the synagogue, fell at his feet. He said, my daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. Jairus' daughter was 12 years old and not a triceratops. So Jesus went with Jairus to his home. Now he was a little slowed down on the way. If you want to know why, read the other story I mentioned earlier. In fact, he was so delayed that a messenger came from Jairus' house and said, Your daughter has died. Do not bother Jesus anymore. But Jesus overheard and said, Do not fear, only believe. So Jesus went to the house and allowed nobody else to follow him except Peter, James and John. When he arrived, everybody was crying. And Jesus said, why are you crying? This child is not dead, but sleeping. They all laughed at him. But Jesus took the girl's mum, dad, as well as Peter, James and John and went inside to where the little girl was. He took the little girl's hand and said, Talitha Kuma. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately, the girl got up and walked around and everybody was amazed and there was a t-rex there there wasn't a t-rex there then jesus said that no one else should know about this and that they should give the little girl something to eat roasted triceratops now in this story we see a crazy miracle of jesus raising someone from the dead. But of course, this wasn't the only time Jesus resurrected someone. The most famous one being when he himself raised back to life at Easter. What an all powerful God we have. I mean, who else can raise people from the dead? Not you, Mr. Diplodocus. You're extinct. Crab time! Today, we're going to recreate the story with paper. So you will need paper, scissors, and pens. And a T-Rex. Firstly, let's draw the background. So we'll definitely need a bed, but then you can put whatever else you want in her room. On a separate piece of paper, we'll draw wide outlines of four people. Mum, Dad, Jesus, and a little girl. If you want, you could do three more as well for Peter, James, and John. On one side, we're going to draw the people before Jesus healed the little girl. So they might be quite sad. On the other side, we'll draw them after the little girl has been healed. So they'll probably be happy. Now, alongside your toys, you also have a picture to help retell the story of Jairus' daughter being raised from the dead. For today's prayers, we are going to thank God that he is all-powerful. And get your arms ready like this so you can join in with me when I say all-powerful. Dear God, 
thank you that you raised Jairus's daughter from the dead. And thank you that Jesus was raised from the dead so that we can have a relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, that you are all powerful. In Jesus' name I pray, Amen. And so, a final thought. Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, just like he himself came back to life after he died on the cross. God is all powerful. And that is a great thing to remember when we're facing difficulties in our life. We have an all powerful God on our side.
good, Lord, under the shadow of your mercy. In this time of uncertainty and distress, sustain us before the anxious and fearful. Lift up all who are brought low, so that we may rejoice in your comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love. In Christ Jesus our Lord. turn now to, to God's Word. We're going to read a couple of passages from the Gospels this morning. Uh, we're going to turn first of all to Matthew, Matthew chapter 3, uh, beginning at verse 13, and then we're going to skip to John's Gospel, uh, John chapter 17, and beginning at verse 20. So first of all, Matthew chapter 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. 
At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and, and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And then turning to, to John 17. Beginning at verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and, and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known, in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and I myself may be in them. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to us this morning. I want to take you back this morning to, uh, do, you remember, do you remember being a teenager? Think, think back, think back a long time. Remember being a teenager? I remember being a teenager quite vividly. And I, I remember several occasions when, 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 uh, when adults around me, sometimes teachers, sometimes parents, Sometimes aunts or uncles or grannies and grandas would, would, ask, would, would ask that big weighty question that people tend to ask around the time when you're, you're 16. When they tend to ask you, what are you going to do with your life? What do you want to be? What are you going to do when you grow up? Which of course at 16 we all found terribly offensive because we were 16. In our own eyes we were already grown up. But that was a heavy question, wasn't it? To be asked, what are you going to do with your life? What, do you, what is it that you, that you are going to spend the next 60 years, 50 years doing? What is it going to be? I don't know about you, but I found that a really difficult question to answer. Most times, I would be, I, I, I would really be be in in desperation because at, at that age, I didn't really have any sense of what I was going to do in my life. And all these people asking me these questions about what are you going to do with your life, I didn't know the answer any more than they did. I was so jealous of those people who, who had it on the tip of their tongue, who had known from when they were six what they wanted to be and hadn't changed. Those who were saying, I'm going to be a teacher. Those who were saying, I'm, I am, I'm, I'm going to be a scientist. Um, I'm going to be a journalist. And I was going, I don't really know what I'm going to be. I don't know where I'm going to go. Um, I, 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 because certainly at that time I didn't have any great sense of what I was going to be. My life felt like quite a mystery at that point. I wonder if, after all, if maybe as I look back on it, I wonder if I was actually that unusual. 
I wonder as I ask you this morning, and I wonder um, how many of you at the age of between 13 and 16 would have struggled to answer that question, would have struggled with it, with it, I don't really know. Maybe it's a more common experience than we like to think. Henry David Thoreau in a, is quoted in, in this book by, by Samuel Wells. And he's, he says there, most people lead lives of quiet desperation. And that's probably true for a lot of people. Whether, whether you are blessed with, with lots of brains, because it doesn't seem to make any difference whether you're a really clever person or, 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 or whether you struggle uh, academically. There's, this, is, this is not a question that intelligence can answer. Those of us who have, have uh, I should say, those, those of us who, who have brains, and I look very much in your direction rather than my direction, um, or, 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 or looks or money or, or, or heritage or whatever we, uh, um, or, or whether we don't have them the sense of destiny the sense of expectation is sometimes missing this story that we read in Matthew's gospel this, this uh, amazing moment in Jesus' life Jesus himself came to be baptized um, he, he came to the uh, to the famously uh, locust eating um, John the Baptist he came to the banks of the Jordan Jordan is a really significant river in uh, in in terms of the, of the history of the children of Israel it was the Jordan was the was the crossing point for the the children of Israel into the promised land Jordan is where uh, they, they, uh, they left behind their history as a people of slavery and, uh, and entered into, uh, into their new identity, a new identity as children of God. And that was probably about 1,500 years before John the Baptist was born. Jesus very deliberately chooses this place and this moment. And John, understandably, I, I suppose, John knowing what he knows about Jesus, having already declared uh, to his disciples, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, probably looks a little, a little aghast, a little shocked, that Jesus has come to him for baptism, knowing that his baptism is a baptism of repentance. And, and uh, John is probably thinking, just, just, just hold, hold on a moment here. You're not the, you're not the oppressive Romans. You're, you're, you're not the, the Egyptians. You're not, uh, uh, neither are you, are you the, our corrupt uh, uh, field religious leadership <coughs> why are you coming here to be baptized it's a fair question and Jesus answers I'm, I'm not here because I need to be saved I'm not here because I need to be uh, because I, I am uh, I'm, I'm uh, I'm not here because of my sin. I'm here because I want to identify with you. I am Israel coming to the Jordan, entering the promised land. This is the way into the promised land. This is the, the stepping stone into the promised land. This is the beginning. This is the moment of stepping into his destiny. This is the moment when it becomes clear to some extent what it is that Jesus is about. He is about leading his people 
into the promised land. And just as the children of Israel crossed the Jordan into the promised land, Jesus came to cross the Jordan to lead us into the promised land. And so John relents and, and Jesus is baptized. And then this wonderful, it's one of those epic moments in the, in the Gospels. The skies, the, the clouds part, the heavens open it says, and, uh, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Two things I want to, to mention about that. Two, again, significant links back to, uh, to, to how, uh, to echoes that, that Christ was, was deliberately choosing or that were deliberately chosen uh, for him by, by his Father God. That tie what he was doing back to what was happening with the children of Israel or, or, the, or that happened in the Old Testament. When I talk to you about a dove, um, in, I think in terms of Old Testament, uh, there's probably only one story really that comes to mind. And it's the story of Noah. The story of, of, of Noah and, and the dove that he sent out to try and figure out, was there dry land? Was there a place that had, had, had trees with leaves? Was there a place that, uh, that, 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 that meant the flood was over? And he sent out the dove, and he sent out the dove again, and then this one time it came back with a, with a twig. And that meant the waters had finally subsided, and then of course God sent the rainbow to say to the earth that, he, that the earth would never be destroyed again. So the appearance of the dove, uh, uh, the Spirit comes in the form of a dove. That is saying, this is about promise. This is the promise coming to fulfillment. This is the, the hope, the hope of, of the living God. This is the resolution. This is the, the, uh, the, the forgiveness you've long sought. This is the restoration of the relationship that has been broken. This is the joining again of that which has been severed. So at Jesus' baptism, Noah's dove comes back. And essentially he says, salvation. Salvation comes. Salvation comes today. And then the other echo takes us right back to Genesis because the dove is the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and Matthew writes about how it is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, uh, the reference to the Holy Spirit that I want to take you to is back in Genesis where it says the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the water. So as the dove points us to Noah, the Spirit takes us right back to new creation, right back to being renewed, to being to, to saying this is where it all starts again. All that went before is, is, is the old. All that went before is the, is, is the field. All that went before is the, is, the, is, the, is the law. And now something wonderful and new has happened. The Spirit of God has, has, has come down again and, and, and alighted on Christ as much as to say, this, this my beloved, my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, this is the new beginning, this is the fresh start. This is what you need. This is what you have not been able to achieve on your own. Genesis 22. 
another uh, terrible <coughs> and dramatic story unfolds. It's the story of, uh, of Abraham and Isaac. And God says to Abraham, take your son, your beloved son, and offer him. We have this frightening story. This story that unsettles us if we have a human heart at all. This story that leaves us cold and fearful and wondering how could, how could that happen? We have long understood that this is a, that, that what happened with, with Isaac, what happened with, uh, with Abraham was a foreshadowing of what would happen with Christ. But for Christ, there was no alternative. There would be no, no ram in the thicket. And God would have to allow something awful. Because so great is his love for us. So great is his longing to restore the relationship, to restore what was broken. But he would allow his son, his only son, his beloved son, to come and to lay down and to allow himself to become a sacrifice for us to show that relationship, to make that relationship be restored. To remind us that we can now have that new relationship, that we can be that new creation. Jesus' birth recalls creation. Jesus' baptism recalls creation. God's words indicate that even, even though he knew what was coming for Jesus, yet he was overjoyed with him, in whom I am well pleased. God smiles, God, God bubbles with joy at what Christ will accomplish, because what Christ will accomplish is our salvation, our rescue, our redemption, our place in glory with the living God. And God smiled. God's heart is made glad. Even despite the dreadful cost. Jesus in that moment stepped into his destiny. And he did it for you. He has made a place. For you. It would be it would be pure wrong to refuse the place that he has offered in light of all that he has undertaken for us. He is the beloved Son of the living God. And He is for us. He is for you and not against you. Amen. Amen. I'm going to bring our service to a close. I'm going to stand and sing together a wonderful hymn of praise. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. This is 10,000 reasons. Let's worship God together.
ever been in uh, in uh, one of those long lines of traffic? You know, you know the ones where you or or, or uh, and you drive along and the, the two lanes filter into one, or maybe three filters into two, and then two into one, and you drive along past the long line of cones. And the one thing you want to see, what is the one thing you want to know at that point? Is somebody actually working it? Yeah. Is Why? Why is there this huge, big, long line of traffic? Why have I been pudling along here at, at 15 miles an hour for the past three miles? And actually, if you come to the end of it and you discover, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's six or seven diggers and they're, they're working away and they're digging and they're doing all, you kind of go, uh, okay, they're doing something. And yet if you come to the end and, and, and you just come to the end and it's just the end of the line of, 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 uh, um, of traffic cones and then everybody filters out again and you're kind of left going, what was that all about? We are people of purpose. We ourselves have a destiny. We ourselves have a calling, a reason to be. We have a purpose in the purpose of God, in the purpose of Jesus Christ. You know that verse in Romans 8 and 28, we know that all things, in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That's a wonderful purpose, a wonderful reminder that we are people of purpose. And even when you may feel yourself that you are, are, uh, are, are bounded by traffic cones and you're quite unsure as to what the destiny is, what the purpose at the end is, you are being built into something glorious. You are being made into a person of importance and significance. Your congregation is being made into a congregation of a purpose and, and, and reason. Just as Christ came to that moment when he stepped across the Jordan in, in to, to lead the people into the promised land, you too have an opportunity to live according to your purpose and to step across your Jordan and into the promised land of grace and mercy and love. Let's share together in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.